Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in her office. Here we are going to actually sit and do proper logic, logical proofs in propositional logic, just me and my whiteboard, and hopefully some useful commentary. So this is a chance for us to put together all of the rules that we've seen in the last couple of videos, the two bookkeeping rules and the introduction and elimination rules for each of the connectives. So I'm just gonna jump right in and start doing it because really the easiest way to learn how to do these proofs is to see them being done because proofs are all about patterns and processes and recognizing when steps that you've done in another proof can be applied in a similar fashion in the proof that you're doing. So at this point, sit back, watch, take a few notes if you want, but don't, don't worry about trying to generate these yourself yet. Wait till you've seen a bunch of examples, and then we'll talk about how you can actually do these sorts of proofs. So the first one that I'm gonna do is if we have if P and Q, then R, not R, and P, I'm gonna show that from this you can derive not Q. So here on the left-hand side of the single turn style, I have my initial assumptions, and on the right-hand side, I have the formula I want to prove. So the very first thing that you do in a proof is you write down all of your initial assumptions, one on each line, and these are going to be annotated with assumption. So we've got P and Q implies R, not R and P. And we draw the little line underneath just to say that all of these are kind of simultaneously assumed. So these are our assumptions. Now, what I would like to prove is not Q. So the main connective of our conclusion is the negation. Well, I could use a negation introduction rule to introduce that. Um, in order to get something with a, ne a negation as a main connective, I can use the negation introduction rule. So that rule says, well, you start a new subproof with a new assumption and you assume the opposite of what it is that you want to prove. So if I want to prove not Q, I assume Q. So now I have another assumption and I have a new subproof. Now, sometimes it's useful every time that you make an assumption other than your initial ones to leave yourself a note as to why you made that assumption. So what rule are you going to use to get rid of the assumption and what is your goal? So like what will signal that you are ready to apply the rule? So here, my assumption is so that I can use negation introduction and what I need to do is get a contradiction. So right now, I don't necessarily know what that contradiction is going to be, but that's my goal. Once I get one, then I can apply negation introduction. Well, let's look at what we have. First of all, we have both P and Q, and this is useful because you can see that we have the conjunction in the antecedent of line one. So I can form that conjunction from conjunction introduction of lines three and four. And this is legitimate because, because this line depends on all of the same assumptions that lines four and lines three depend on. So I can bring this P into the subproof because it still depends on the assumption of P. Now that I have if P and Q, or sorry, I have P and Q, I also have if P and Q then R. So through conditional elimination, I can, so citing lines one and lines five, I can write down the consequence of the conditional, which is R. But I already have not R as one of my assumptions. So let me reiterate that down here because look at that, I have a contradiction. From the assumption of Q, I was able to prove both, uh, or I need to make that scope line a bit shorter. I was able to prove both R and not R. Look, I got a contradiction. So now I can close off this little subproof. And over here on line eight, I can say, well, it has to be the case that not Q. Negation, introduction, lines four to seven. There you have it. All right. I'm going to clear the board. If you need to, if you want to jot any of this down for your own purposes, pause now, come back in a moment because I'm going to clear the board and start a new one. 
So the second one that I would like to prove is, here we go. If P implies Q and P implies R, then P implies Q and R. So again, on the left-hand side, we have the two premises. On the right-hand side, we have our conclusion. Every single proof starts by writing down your premises and annotating them with assumption. So now, look at what you're trying to prove. What you're trying to prove is a conditional. Well, what does the conditional introduction rule look like? It says, if you can assume the antecedent and from that assumption derive the consequent, then you can use negation introduction. So again, sorry, conditional introduction. I'm going to give myself just, this is not part of the annotations of your proof. This is just a reminder for yourself of why you're doing what you're doing. Because anytime that you make a new assumption, you have to have some way of getting rid of it by the end of your proof. So the assumption here is for conditional introduction, and what I want to do is get Q and R. So first thing to note is that line three is the antecedent of both the conditionals in one and two. So we can apply conditional elimination, first citing lines one and lines three, and then conditional elimination, citing lines two and three, which gets us Q and R as individual formulas, our goal is to get them together as a conjunction, but that's just what conjunction introduction allows us to do, citing lines four and five. And now we've shown that from the assumption of P, we can get Q and R, which means I can close off this subproof, move outside the assumption of P, and turn this into a conditional that says, if I have P, then I can get Q and R. So that's conditional introduction. And remember, this cites a range, so the entire subproof, not just a set of lines. And so we have from lines three to six. There you go. So there's two examples. I'll probably do a couple more videos with more examples because at this stage, really what you want to do is you just want to see the process going. And then we will reach a point where I will start getting you to do the process and you can start having all of the fun of doing propositional proofs. They really are just like doing little, they're like logic puzzles. It's making explicit the sort of reasoning that you do if you're doing something like Sudoku. So if you have any enjoyment of that sort of thing, or like the logic puzzles where you have to figure out, you know, if Jane can't sit next to Mary and Mary will only sit next to Bob and, you know, Bob's two cousins shouldn't be allowed to drink and, you know, all of these kind of like seating arrangement logic puzzles, if you like these, you're gonna love these proofs because it's basically exactly the same thing and they're just so satisfying. Anyway, see you next time for more proofs. Take care, cheers.